Čo to ja si myslím? No tak potom to, daj to, zatiaľ to nahraj, cez nejakú kávovú prestávku to spravíme. Nebudem čakať už na ďalších. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We are about to start the afternoon session of the first day of our Congress. I just have some small technical notes. There were some particular problems with the Spanish, with listening to the translation, so I hope this will be solved now. And uh, just uh, for very practical reasons, we would like to uh, ask those who participate in discussions uh, to say uh, first the name, if, if it's possible, because uh, some of uh, our mm, uh, some of the people here might not know you, and maybe the country you are from. Yes. Uh, another thing, there is an exhibition here just uh, behind the bar. So, unless maybe you have some some spare minutes, so then you can see the show. And there will be another opening after four o'clock uh, in in the building just just uh, across the park. Uh, as the students exhib exhibition of the students uh, from uh, department of art in Technical University in here in Košice. And uh, the last thing, yesterday somebody uh, uh, forget, has forgotten the jacket in, uh, in uh, Eva Mate's house. The gray jacket is, is there in the, in, in the lobby. And somebody <laughs> got the glasses here. <laughs> so lost and we, we, we'll establish the lost and found department then. And we'll send it to you later. I am very happy to, that I can announce now the lecture of a uh, very fine uh, Czech art historian and art critic, Tomáš Pospíšil, who is uh, now starting to work for the second year in Academy of Fine Arts in, in Prague, in the Department of Art History. He's critic, curator, and historian. He worked, formerly he worked for the National Gallery in Prague, but for our, uh, but for our, our environment is uh, mainly famous by three books. It's, uh, first one is uh, the Anthology of American Critical Text. Uh, second one is uh, the Primary Documents, a source book for Eastern and Central European art since 1950s, which he edited with Laura Hauptmann from, uh, uh, and was published by the Brooklyn Art Museum but by Museum of Modern Art in New York. And the third one is a small book, uh, but uh, very interesting, about connections between uh, Czech and international artists uh, during the era of uh, socialism, the connections mental and connections uh, physical. It's called, uh, it's called uh, comparative studies. So I'm happy to have you here, and it's your turn now. Uh, thank you very much for introduction and for inviting me over. Uh, would you like me to raise my arm when I will attempt to make a joke? Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll read my paper in English. Uh, I'll show no images because all relevant ones were already shown by Piotrowski. Um, it will last about 36 minutes. Uh, let me start with a statement uh, which is neither new or surprising. World art history insufficiently reflects the art from smaller regions. With respect to the place where this Congress is being held, it is only logical that many case studies on this topic will focus primarily on Eastern Europe. To the simple question why the history of Eastern European art is poorly integrated in the world history this meeting will surely offer a number of interesting answers. There are even entire ambitious revisions of the methodological approach towards the way how to write the history of art. One of the most successful one, due to which it is paradoxically also the most criticized one, is Piotr Piotrowski's horizontal art history. The importance of Piotrowski's reflections doesn't lie in a miraculous solution to the existing cultural asymmetries. It is rather the insightful analysis of the current state of affairs, which we take to be natural 
once and for all. As Piotrowski writes, it is necessary to bear in mind the orientalizing effect of Western art on the periphery. It is essential to carefully analyze who and with what intent creates the narrative of the history of art and from the position of the periphery question the existing vertically hierarchical conception of cultural history. The fundamental question then remains whether the history of art is not in its essence a canonical, reductive, and thus also vertical discipline. A horizontal art history, and that is so far the best what we have, fits ideally in the horizontally structured world. Despite all necessary simplifications, our world has many dimensions. A horizontal art history would also have its consequences not only in the direction from Eastern Europe, but also towards it. For example, in denationalization of permanent exhibitions of local museums, which, despite the best effort and optimism, I cannot imagine. The dynamics between the center and periphery of world art is a topic which in the last 20 years has been in Eastern Europe seen as crucial. Unlike other problems, it has been opened by local art historians again and again. Eastern Europe has and still feels that it is overlooked by the center. Its artistic production, often very similar to the production from the center, is not, according to local art historians, sufficiently confronted with the Western canon, let alone admitted to it. Understandably, this raises frustration. As Piotrowski writes, if an East European art historian browses through books like, for instance, Art After 1900, which became an authoritative teaching aid uh, for the art of the last hundred years, they will find very few examples of artistic production from their region. The explanation of such disproportion has traditionally risen from the political circumstances. Former socialist countries restricted creative freedom the Iron Curtain did not allow for free exchange of people, art, works, and information. When the Iron Curtain fell in 1989, uh, many believed that in short time, the free movement of people and ideas will influence the reception of local art outside its place of origin. The only question was the length of this transition period. Such expectations were based on the political rhetoric according to which, after 1989, the East European countries should quickly adopt the Western political system and market economy. However, it is clearer and clearer that this transition period, after which we will completely merge with Western Europe politically, economically, and culturally, is a great illusion. It is a permanent condition. I dare to say that in 20, 30, or even 50 years, it will be possible to organize a meeting of art historians from Eastern Europe on the topic of white places, and we will hear similar arguments at it again. The continuing and specific urgency of the issue of the relationship of East European art and world art is, in my opinion, um, arises from, uh, in my opinion, from the overall concept of the identity of the East European space after 1989. After the fall of totalitarian communist regimes, the ideology of the so-called great return prevailed here, that is, the return of Eastern Europe into the womb of Western civilization. As if communism in Eastern Europe had stalled development and eroded an age-long relationship with Western culture. The historical experience of communism, including its culture, has been relegated to the position of a historical anomaly imported from Soviet Union. While life in socialist states was considered deviant, Western values have naturally become the standard of normality. After the collapse of Soviet Union and the short period of transformation, countries such as Czechoslovakia, Poland, or Yugoslavia should have returned to Europe. Somewhere here, I would be looking for the reason for an increased need to compare Eastern art with the West. 
The comparison is conducted with a belief that we will find undoubted parallels between the art of both worlds, confirming the same pedigree and the possibility of communion. Would somebody who was put into the role of the returning one, especially after 40 years of absence, must inevitably be always behind. East European art is sometimes seen as imperfect, immature version of Western art, and its value is determined by the ability of catching up with the achievements of world art and ability to seamlessly stream into its paradigm. A hypothetical integration of the art of Eastern Europe into the world art history is a process which will necessarily be perceived in two completely different perspectives. In the perspective of the center and in the perspective of the periphery. These views cannot be easily or cannot be at all synchronized or equalized. While East European art historians subconsciously accept the aforementioned ideological project of the great return, Western art historians take a more sober and notably more critical look at the art from the periphery. For Eastern European history of art, their attitude might sometimes be on the verge of an insult. For example, in the Czech Republic, the local cubism is a point of pride and a prominent position of the national history of art. But the icon of the world art history, Rosalind Krauss, openly writes about it as of an example of misunderstanding of the nature of this movement. Quote, uh, there are at the exhibition 17 works by the Czech adepts Fila, Kubišta, Procházka, Beneš, Gutfreund, and Čapek that attest to the orgy of academism that the new style unleashed on European art. The end of quote. In his book, uh, Art History After Modernism, the famous German art historian Hans Belting dedicates to East European art a whole chapter, concluding that the artistic production from this region is poor, lagging behind the rest of the world, and that is more, it treats world art in a parasitic way. According to Belting, East and West do not share any common past. Of course, neither Krauss or Belting are to blame. They just examine art without the ideological glasses of the great return. Lot, uh, last but not least, I believe that the East European desire to enter into the world history of art has much deeper roots and reflects the mentality of the national revival of the 19th century. That is, the need to create unique yet competitive culture equal to other world cultures. It is indeed a sign of art of all small nations, not only in Eastern Europe. The formation of national culture can be compared to the formation of the national army. Mercenaries of any origin and language somewhere in the 18th and 19th century become an army strongly identified with the national idea for which they are even willing to die. Likewise, artists start to identify with their emerging nations and the nation begins to give them tasks. Their role is to build local art history and identity through art, often from scratch, and explain it either inwards, the nation, or outwards. Therefore, artists from Eastern Europe have a lot of experience with the cultural dynamics between the center and the periphery. The whole area of Eastern Europe in the 19th century culturally formed itself in the space between the effects of German and Russian colonialism, these being not only of economical and political nature, but of ideological and cultural as well. Cosmopolitan modernism then brought other cultural centers of Western world on the scene. Eastern artists picked up many st stimuli from these centers and they tried to succeed in them. In their approach, they accepted elements of modern visual language and mutated or transformed it, be it unintentional by accident 
or on purpose, in a gesture of rebellion against the dominant culture. The dynamics between the cosmopolitan modern art interferes with die-hard nationalism here. This is a classic cultural manifestation of countries with colonial history. The language of the dominant culture is used to build a minority culture while subversively undermining the cultural dominance. But despite the seeming orientation of national revivals towards the distant past of um, national great history, the national revival is a process typical for modern society. Such dynamics were not characteristic not only for avant-garde modernism. In the Czech interval culture and elsewhere in the region, long and similar discussions as about modernism were held about socialist realism as well. It is an artistic doctrine which needs to be accepted or is there a point in an attempt and its modification? So maybe we cannot, um, um, as Piotrowski said, maybe Prague was not only one of the capitals of surrealism, but maybe one of the capitals of socialist realism as well. After the Second World War, Czechoslovakia formed an aversion to the cultural Sovietization, but also, on a certain level, to all world art, which was perceived as inherently foreign. Let us stop investigating the reasons why Eastern Europe is not sufficiently included in the world history of art, and let us try to ask ourselves a question why we should be even be there. Let us accept our position on the margins of world art history as a fact and see it as a positive chance to better understand ourselves. I do not say this from a position of national isolationism, but as somebody who has attempted integration himself. Uh, I participated in the preparation of the anthology of theoretical texts from Eastern Europe, primary documents, to be published by MoMA. The aim of the anthology was to translate into English fundamental texts of art from this area and to popularize it for the Western reader in such a way that the original East European art paradigm would be conveyed most faithfully. The result, however, was paradoxical. The publication has the greatest appeal among the art, art historians in Eastern Europe. In my text, next book, Comparative Studies, I tried for a direct confrontation between Eastern and Western art. Although the appearance or theoretical concept looked very similar, it mostly showed that comparisons were forced and led to very superficial conclusions. These projects thus did not lead to the desired results, but rather to methodological or even ideological difficulties. A mere definition of Eastern Europe proved to be very problematic. Almost nobody wants to be Eastern Europe, and very often for very good reasons. That is, if we see it from the perspective of the periphery. However, it is the same as if someone insists that Italian Renaissance art is only fiction, and we have, to, uh, we have the right to speak only about the art of Florence or Venice. Each concept of national art is an artificial construct, in the case of individual East European regions, so recent that it does not allow us a broader perspective. At the same time, let us admit that the ability of East European artists to tackle other experience than the one which is immediately nationally and politically conditioned is very low. This leads to the formation of a sort of Creole art, if you are from Eastern Europe, you can still become a major world artist and use a cosmopolitan artistic language, but only in the hated ideological context of Eastern Europe, which will, uh, uh, with which it is not easy to identify. When some of these artists become successful, which for technical reason often means living in the West, such an artist is often excommunicated from national art in order to be able to come back to the womb of national art, their presence at home and renunciation of all perpetrated features of cosmopolitanism is required. The requirement for an art which would be globally equal and comp comprehensible is apparently absurd. 
It is similarly utopian idea like wanting the mankind to abandon historically formed languages and start to communicate by means of Esperanto or another artificial language. However, modern art formed a certain kind of Esperanto. Impressionists or Cubists from Sweden, Argentina, or Australia use similar art artistic language. They might not understand each other, but it sounds similar. The contemporary art world is fascinating with its global dimension, which corresponds to the developments of communication technology and economic globalization. From the perspective of the cultural periphery, this aspect tends to be of quasi-religious nature. The global, art, uh, the global art world and its emphasis on multi multiculturalism creates an impression that art is the perfect means of understanding among nations, a model of an ideal world community in a spirit of the great religions. Artists and art historians from all around the world travel, travel to various biennials or to documenta without realizing how much their travels resemble religious pilgrimages to Rome or Mecca. In Venice or Castle, then they experience a feeling of common unity. Like a pilgrim from Morocco meets a pilgrim from Indonesia in front of the Kaaba to realize their Muslim solidarity, great world exhibitions too create a mystical communion of contemporary art. If artists and art historians from Eastern Europe ever experience that great return, then it is at such exhibitions where they are moved by the look at the representatives from their country. The members of the art periphery reassure themselves uh, that their work is meaningful even outside their immediate context. Whereas the artists from the center get the impression here that their art has universal, universal qualities which appear as local mutations even in utterly exotic destinations. Therefore, the visibility of East European art in the world can have different dimensions and often unwanted consequences. The ideal idea of this visibility is fulfilled by major international publications and events where are alongside canonical artists, equally represented artists from other regions as well. Exhibitions such as global conceptualism do include a whole geographic specter of manifestations, but their message might be of a different nature than the curators themselves intended. Given the actual definition of conceptual art and its chronology, it might happen that the art from the peripheral areas serves there only to confirm the primacy and dominance of the art from the center. Similar developments of art have served as evidence of the objective evolution in art. If neoconstructivism or op art appeared in the 1950s in Paris, then similar production from Belgrade or Prague from the 1960s acts as a confirmation of the logic of similar development. In a similar vein, manifestations close to American happenings outside the USA seemingly show that other cultures and national arts too must reach the same stage of the art evolution. Therefore, American spectators might look at the similar happenings from the periphery with the same sympathy, curiosity, and sentiment as if they met a living caveman. I believe that the logic of art historical research in Eastern Europe should take an opposite direction. That means stop looking for what could be put into the context of Western art, and on the contrary, focused on the research of the official socialist art. I think that in this respect, Germany has come the longest way. Here they realize that German art is not only Joseph Beuys or Gerhard Richter, the later one even with a personal legend of an escape to the normal world, but also the art of the former GDR belongs to in it. If in Eastern Europe exists 
a white place or a black hole, then the public art of socialist era is in it. This massive layer of art is literally invisible to the institutions involved in the research and protection of fine arts. The faith of the official art from the period of socialism is last but not least proof of how, how East European art and thinking about it suffers from a total lack of self-reflection. So far, rather artists than art historians deal with it. With the fact that its analysis, uh, the analysis of this cultural heritage is not important only to the history of art as an academic discipline, but it might also serve one of the crucial issues of today, that means the understanding of continuities and discontinuities between our past and present. Today's unwillingness to deal with the official art from the 1950s to the 1980s is even more complicated by the use of the term socialist realism. It became a caricature of an artistic style from which, at least in a Czech environment, deriv derivativeness and ideological dependence is apparent. We find out that in terms of style, in Czechoslovakia, pure socialist realism actually never existed and therefore it is no use dealing with it at all. Perhaps it would be much more productive and honest to think about socialist realism not only as about a narrowly defined style of the art production of the Stalinist era, but as about a whole set of conditions under which artists created in the times of the socialist state, which is exactly the unique element that can get our region into textbooks. I suggest thinking about socialist realism as about a category into which would fall all East European artists living and creating from the end of the World War II until the fall of the Iron Curtain. The term would thus describe not only the form of artworks, but mainly those circumstances due to which the situation of artists in the East differed from the conditions of artists working in Western Europe or the USA. We should realize that the position in the wide places of the map is unique. It is what makes a specific communion. What Czech, Slovak, Polish or Bulgarian art has in common is particularly its invisibility or better said, its non includability in the known categories and not its superficial closeness to the manifestations of pop art or overdue reactions to fluxes. We should not waste time proving that even in Eastern Europe there was a minimalism, but we should sell what is nowhere else to be found and that is socialist realism. But hand on heart, how many studies on socialist realism has been written recently? How many have been published in some of the world languages? And how many authors of these works come from the area behind the former Iron Curtain? The basis of the development of our discipline in the global context should be rejection of the metaphors of white places and courage for our own art historical narrative. The map on which Eastern Europe is marked as a white spot is surely not our map, and if we have to use it, we will certainly get lost. Last but not least, we have to write better and more critically. We have to try so that our studies would not be only lists of names, superficial descriptions, or a collections of an adapted methodology, since they should show all qualitative features of a serious and deeply analytical history of art. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for so directly oriented contribution and for your advices 
what we have to do in the field of art history. It's a challenge. <laughs> and now we have space for questions. Nobody? Ah, yes, I, okay. Oh, hello. Mm -hmm. Okay, hello. Uh, Henry Mary Hughes, uh, thank you very much, Thomas, for I think an absolutely wonderful uh, trick of throwing open all the options, and I think it's, it's very, very necessary. First of all, the whole question of East Europe, which is, uh, uh, to me, a dubious package, and to you it must seem uh, like dust in your, in your fingers. Um, we, we know each other too little, that, that's, that's evident. Um, but we also know ourselves too little. And by the time, uh, for instance, I'm writing a catalogue on quite a well-known sculptor in Croatia, and I've been asking around here uh, if he's known. He's not known at all. I mean, you don't know what happened next door. But by the time you don't know what uh, happened next door, you realize in England, which was, uh, you know, we know nothing at all. England, Britain was a periphery 20 years ago. Peripheries change as well. I mean, since the YBAs were not the periphery, are we any? better off for it? I don't know, but it's an interesting question. Um, then uh, I, I would say there's, there's um, uh, one has to, obviously one has to see art history or art histories as, as uh, in dynamic terms, not only the peripheries, but the sort of ideas. And, and uh, uh, this is what Pierre Restani, for instance, when he talked of an art autre, he talked of a different art, but it wasn't always the same art. He was constructing the history as he uh, viewed and examined uh, local histories. And um, the, w there is a danger, I think, that each of that we're all going to lose our local histories in a kind of swamp of globalization. And I think uh, up to date there is a real, there is a real problem because uh, we're tending more and more to use the same kind of media both for communicating and expressing ourselves, same kind of language and we're talking with, with a kind of laundrette language about the art which is very specific to place and to time. Uh, Chinese uh, artists will talk about uh, questions of uh, openness and democracy and so on, we say yes, 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 but we mean totally different things because we're defining things, as you say, against a different ideological and political and social background. Uh, I mean, I've been involved also, uh, Piotr was, it was a, a wonderful help and advisor in a Council of Europe exhibition, which was exactly an attempt to do a horizontal art history of Europe, which is comparing artists and individual works of art against a social and ideological background. And what we read, your plea is something that I support, which is to look locally as well and to look at the individual work of art and the conditions in, it was, in which it was produced. It may be relevant today, it may be irrelevant tomorrow, but let's have a dynamic approach to all these issues. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not only language, as, as you said, that um, uh, gets sort of um, globalized and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's blurring the uh, differences, but um, for art history, it's also the whole methodology, how we think about uh, art. It's not, it's not only language, but the overall uh, instrument that we use to, uh, to understand art as well. So, uh, Laszlo Becker, uh, I would discuss a little bit your proposal concerning socialist realism. So, I, I could try to do what you propose, but I can't. I, I hated socialist realism, the kind which was uh, proposed for us in Hungary, and the system was at that time that the the most basic theories of social realism of Zdanov and people like that arrived to a kind of liberalization telling that socialist realism is not a style but a method. And we arrived to, uh, at the end, to an ideology that, that is not social realism but social art. And what is social art? Is social art do for the society? And this would be very correct. But it's already full with contradictions. And with the falling of the wall, uh, step by step, socialist realism 
were very fashionable and came together with the discovering on the left, uh, leftist movement or worker class movement in the 20, 20s and uh, 30s, which was again very positive, you know. And so I, I participate in a project that everybody tried to, uh, tried to reconstruct all kind of variation of the socialist realism in theory, the realizations in the different countries, and to arrive at a very correct historical, art historical uh, document and uh, analysis, but not to follow the way for a new re re uh, and, uh, uh, revival of socialist realism, which is at the end always suggestive. One more thing that why is so fashionable also today uh, uh, Chinese social realism because it's very funny, very funny. It's a number one for for art market for for postmodern theories, and we are walking round and round and round. But but it's for me not a, not a, not a, an example to follow. That's I uh, I hope that I didn't offend you with, with my proposition, but uh, it's, uh, the, the point was to, to provoke myself, to provoke you, uh, how, how, how to think about art from 1945 to 1980s and how to describe it. And um, I simply use this term to explain the conditions under which the art in that period was created. And I imagine that in 200 years from now, uh, it will be quite difficult and complex to explain what was going on in those decades. And uh, it will be um, maybe a, a, a part of uh, art historians' uh, deal uh, to explain these conditions that were quite unique. Um, uh, that's why I s um, adopted, uh, appropriated the term and twist it into this uh, uh, position and this uh, proposal. Okay, this is better. Dag Solhjell, Norway. Uh, what you were talking about is in a way how to overcome an unpleasant history. And for you, this unpleasant history starts in 1945. But Eastern Europe has another and earlier and uh, likewise uh, unpleasant history under fascism. And, and what you talk, you should extend your studies uh, back to the 1930s. So parts of Eastern Europe, you could say, socialism came as a punishment for what some of these countries did or not did during the Second World War. How, I, I how can you? How can you do? How do one rehabilitate artists that were collaborators during these two black regimes, black holes? I'm, I'm not sure if uh, there is a, such a thing as punishment in in a history. Um, I think it works only on personal level. And uh, it is a whole talk on art and ethics uh, that would deserve a whole, not only panel, but the whole conference. Um, how to deal with it, how relevant it is to the uh, work uh, of, of the artists. And it is something that is uh, still being a very hot topic uh, in the region now, uh, in, in Slovakia, in 
uh, Czech Republic. Maybe we will hear more about this tomorrow. Yeah, okay. Um, from your excellent uh, presentation, I have was interested uh, about the future of the art criticism. Uh, because you mentioned that great return, you want uh, the return of Eastern Europe even to the wound of Western civilization. But that uh, makes me feel worries about, uh, is it in the future the term of global consumerization? In the globalization, that is a black hole uh, in the future. And Especially, you mentioned the Esperanto language as a unique, uh, maybe unique form or style. And just uh, Henry mentioned that Chinese uh, character, Chinese language is impossible to be included in the Esperanto, the idealistic dream. So, would you please show us in the Far East uh, people? or culture or arts, how to go out back to the womb of the earth, not the term of the globalization and consumerization, please. Uh, <coughs> white and uh, uh, black in times, future and uh, history, why? When? My question. I'm not sure I understood your question. Can you please repeat your question. Uh, I think uh, our president uh, Chen was uh, thinking about uh, the future. What is uh, the end of the greater return in your paper, your presentation? Yeah. What is the future of the great return? Yes, the uh, end uh, of it, the great return. I think it, return. it is an illusion that it should not happen, uh, that I don't see how, uh, or it will be a great mistake to get assimilated uh, into this uh, global uh, liberal capitalism and, and, and all its, its consequences. And that was the whole point of, uh, of my paper, uh, that uh, we have to create our own narrative. And um, also an important point is that what seems to be as only art historical problem, uh, how do we get um, uh, local artists into the world art history books, in fact um, arises from political ideology, especially here in, in, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, where uh, this uh, uh, suddenly this uh, uh, great returned, uh, return uh, ideology uh, become uh, very, very popular in uh, uh, 1990s uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, the uh, changes after 1989. Yeah. I have a uh, hello, I'm sorry. Uh, Me louder guess, uh, or the mic louder? Do we have other? Uh, um. Ooh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Yara Budnova. Um, actually, I will not make this gesture, Thomas, which I like very much, but it's a quotation. Where are the West Ends? <laughs> it's actually, it's, it's the name of the text of Boris Groys on uh, former West Conference, so that's why it was the quotation mark. I don't think I, I know how to answer this question, but it's, it's westwards from here, that's for sure. 
Uh, where the McDonald's sign ends? That's everywhere, I'm afraid. All right. Uh, I, I, w I would like to, uh, Marek Bartelik, I would like to make uh, two comments. One is um, we talk about horizontal and vertical kind of art history. Um, I've been thinking about diagonal art history. So perhaps that could be <laughs> a third solution. I don't like this kind of dialectics that's either this way or that way. Maybe diagonal would be a, a third solution. And the other thing, it's very interesting. I actually very much enjoyed your paper and, and it's kind of funny because I've been teaching, you know, the, the three part kind of art history for 10 years already, including socialist realism as part of the the, the, the three kind of possibilities, you know, rather than seeing it as kind of modern, avant-garde, whatever it is. And I, I think it's a very interesting, uh, well, I teach it so it obviously it interests me, but, but it, it's interesting also because what, what you said about, uh, you know, how, well, uh, the gentleman from Hungary, how painful it is to deal with imagery that, that has sort of historical memory and is very fresh and so on. Well, when you think about people like David and, uh, you know, the, the, the artists who produced uh, paintings during the French Revolution, you may say that this was sort of uh, a version of socialist realism. It had very painful connotations. So in a way, art history is full of those kind of examples where, you know, works of art carry the weight of, of kind of, uh, you know, history in itself and are painful and the generations it takes uh, perhaps hundred years, perhaps 50 years, perhaps 200 years to forget about this aspect of imagery. So uh, perhaps it will take time to, to also deal with social realists without this kind of emotional reaction which is unavoidable, I think. So I, I don't, one question that I have to you maybe would be uh, one thing which I find sometimes uh, interesting is that uh, scholars from uh, Eastern Europe often have this sort of uh, double perspective. So you, I'm not saying you, but in general, that there is a discourse which is an internal discourse and there is an international discourse. And the two are not sometimes compatible. In other words, you know, people can be very critical on the, of the Western kind of paradigm and institutions, but when they are invited by the Western institutions, they don't have any reservations towards them. So could you talk about this a little bit? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll go to your uh, previous uh, statements. Um, if, if you walk around Košice or any other ta uh, town in, in uh, Eastern Europe, you can find many, many public sculptures from socialist times. Uh, they are, 99% of them are bad. But still, I feel that we as a critics or art historians are somehow failing if we are not dealing with this material. It is the same as if we were living in a country with uh, hundreds and thousands of examples of uh, Baroque art and somehow we would be ignoring uh, this uh, layer of our history. Uh, we have to deal with it uh, critically, analytically, but it's here, it's not invisible. It is part of our environment now and it is part of our history that somehow uh, we have to solve. Uh, to the second statement, uh, maybe uh, the reason is also the uh, mobility of, of scholars uh, from this region or possibility to collaborate on international projects. There aren't that many of them. So um, maybe that's why uh, the, 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 the thinking uh, uh, sometimes seems to be very isolationist or isolated uh, from, uh, from the um, state of the discipline in other countries. Uh, Susan Snodgrass. Um, you've picked up on it a little bit, but um, I think your uh, model of socialist realism is, is a kind of 
looking to the past, and I'm picking up on some threads that were brought up by someone over here, and I think the role of the critic is to really talk about the present, to talk about contemporary art and its connection to the political past, uh, its meaning in the present, and, and what it can mean for the future. And I think that um, maybe some other kinds of models might be something so much more interdisciplinary, something that is not up or down, or maybe the, di I kind of like the diagonal, but I'm thinking of maybe a curve, or <laughs> a, oval, kind of, oval, oval. A, a kind of conceptual mapping that um, is almost more like urbanism. Uh, you're talking about the socialist realist statue that or was on the plaza that was ugly, and I thought the singing fountain was very ugly on the, on the and um, so it seems to me that if we look at things like urbanism, if we look at environmentalism, um, these were some of the things that are also the future black holes that this other gentleman brought up. So I think that this seems so much in the past to me, and I'm, I'm thinking maybe that's more of the task of the historian or the art historian. And it's not to say that critics don't play that role mm. sometime, but I'm trying to frame it more but in the present. As, as I also mentioned, many contemporary artists are actually um, uh, dealing with this problem. For example, uh, Little Warsaw in, um, in, in Hungary, the, the artist collective. And uh, their action, I forgot the name of it, um, uh, when they removed uh, the sculpture and, and put it into uh, exhibition abroad. It, it sort of very nicely opened uh, this, this problem and the discussion, uh, how do we deal with this heritage? So, but then that's where the critic comes in. So the yeah. critic identifies those kinds of projects and puts them in the larger frame. Hi, uh, I'm Ruben Falk. Hi, hi Tomas. Uh, uh, two, two kind of diff different uh, things that, that came out of uh, your uh, lecture for me. One on, on the, on the uh, question of uh, socialist realist uh, monuments. And you say, you know, they're, they're here and they're al always going to be with us. It just, just brings to mind the situation in, in Hungary where, uh, you know, at the moment the you know, just to give one example, the, the square in front of the parliament is being totally transformed and the clock is being turned back to uh, 1944. And, uh, you know, the, the, the monuments that were erected during the uh, socialist period, for example, the, the monument to 1848, the monument to Kossuth, is being has, been, has been removed and they're bringing back the old one that was demolished in the early 50s and was erected in the 30s. Uh, you know, the monument to the... Uh, uh, the uh, first uh, president of um, the Hungarian Republic of uh, uh, 1918 or 1919. I can't, I can't remember the exact details. That's also been uh, been removed because that doesn't fit in with the ideology. So that's something that you're seeing. I mean, in a way, it's a kind of a re there, there's still this in some places, or you know, maybe it'll go on forever in uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia and certain other countries. But maybe it is also kind of a, an endangered. Um, uh, 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 a kind of legacy of the past that our historian should move a little bit quicker uh, uh, on dealing with. The, the second question uh, or point, which is in a, a different direction, um, uh, ju just thinking of what you're saying about the, the 90s and this moment where this kind of disappointment of, of the way that uh, the Western approach to East European art history turned out to be quite shallow and uh, maybe artists were just picked up to reinforce the uh, uh, the Western canon and uh, and so on. What, but what, what I was wondering is, where, what would satisfy us in Eastern Europe, if I may? Like, what what would be uh, what would be okay? Is that you know, is the current project that was mentioned, MoMA's CMAP project, and the fact that they you know last year or the year before, I think they changed their collection. You know, you know, you know to to include other areas and not to be so. Uh, uh, Kind of uh, v vertical and tied to the tied to these old Western narratives. Does what, does that satisfy us? Is is, is there a, a space of negotiation, or should we give up? And maybe maybe the little bit of, of a pessimism that I felt in your uh, talk was maybe also a, a provocation to maybe not to be so uh, pessimistic. I don't know what what will satisfy us, and uh, it's the satisfaction cannot come from the outside. It has to come from the inside. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, let's 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 write great 
art history of our countries, which, which we are still lacking in, 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 uh, in many instances, uh, complex ones. Um, I was interested in the remark you made about subversion and the use of language. And V.S. Nepal has written about this particular concept um, with regard to India yeah? and how the colonialist subjects appear to be more English than the English. But in their adoption of the colonialist language, there was a subversion taking place. And perhaps it's in a consideration of that subversion, whether in literature or the visual arts, um, where a rereading of the visual arts in Eastern Europe uh, lies, rather than the adoption of uh, orthodox art historical styles and modes and so forth, drawing upon the theories of post-colonialist uh, studies. Uh, and I think that would be more of a zigzag line than a, either a vertical, horizontal, or indeed a curved line. Okay, I, I have a question. Yeah, my um, observation is that it's very important to uncover the the unpleasant histories, the the things, the the work you mentioned, the monuments, the socialist um, uh, ideology, ideology with um, work that you feel that you need to look at, even though you may consider it bad or um, within an Eastern European context, because. There are enormous lessons to be learned in understanding much deep, more deeply visual languages, which has as much relevance to uh, the Western canon as to um, a deeper understanding of, your, of uh, an Eastern or Central European art history. Um, on a, my, my own personal sort of um, story about this is I got very interested in National Socialist painting. And I, I published a, a, a piece on, we had a group of artists working in Scotland uh, in the 80s. They were known as the Glasgow Boys. Uh, the work is not very good, much of it. But I wrote a stinging, um, and it was uh, well received, but um, shocked the recipients. It was simply called Glasgow's Volkish Kitsch. But it was an unpacking, really, of a visual language which had roots in other cultures and other... In, in National Socialism, I actually made reference to Gilbert and George. I made reference to Robert Wilson and Robert Longo at that time with particular works in, I think, Documenta. And it was really to do with common visual languages which had very different uh, applications and very different roots and which um, we need to understand better. And artists need to understand the languages they, that they're using. And I think uncovering these histories of Eastern and Central European socialist realism has a great deal to teach, much wide, more widely than... Um, the specific countries in which the work is produced. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanash. Maybe I would just add that it's not only visual language, but the whole, and maybe also history and sociology uh, should be taken place here, like to understand what does it mean when being an artist okay. become a certain type of profession under socialism when you are basically employed by the state and what does it to your art um, to understand you know all the positive but also the negative uh, places to it so it's, it's it's a very complex history behind all these objects okay thank you and i have to stop discussions <laughs> <laughs>
because we are 30 minutes later. Thank you, Tomasz. Mm -hmm.